I used to love V for Vendetta, the 2005 film. It delightfully skewered a lot of the political situation in the world at that time. The voice of London was pretty obviously just Bill O'Reilly with an English accent. Chancellor Sutler wasn't George Bush, but only because he was eloquent and seemed to be able to think clearly. But beyond the political, it was also a really good film. It had nice action scenes, a compelling plot, and a wonderful sense of style. And I re-watched it yesterday, and I kind of hate it now. Let's start off with the good things I only noticed on my recent watch. I loved how many echoes there were in the film, moments where shots were repeated throughout the film. Some of these were extremely obvious, and others less so. I thought that was neat. These shots engage with a few of the core themes. The shots of Evie's parents and Stephen Fry getting black bagged, for example, could be read as the film saying, this exact sort of thing keeps happening, it's not going to stop unless someone makes them stop. Another reading is the film saying, the exact same thing happening to these two characters means they are the same person in every meaningful sense, which sets up the film's final few lines. However, the film has a few problems which I only noticed this time around. First, Evie Hammond does precisely two things in the film which affect the plot. First, she maces Lestrade near the start of the film, and second, she throws the lever which blows up Parliament. She takes other actions throughout the film. She tries to warn the Bishop of Bath and Wells about V's imminent assassination attempt, meaning she's not completely without agency. It's just that none of her actions change anything. In a very real sense, Evie spends the film being shuffled from place to place so characters can talk at her. I really don't like that it took me 19 years to realise that. Second, V kidnaps Evie. He tortures her, he traumatises her. Then, when she refuses to give him up, she thinks she's been grabbed by the security services. He lets her go, saying she's free of fear. Evie, noticeably, says she doesn't feel anything, which is very different. Evie could be experiencing a number of things, from disassociation, to derealization, to emotional numbing, and these are all things which people with PTSD or CPTSD might feel. But it was worth it, right? They had to do that in order to free Evie from fear. <sighs> Third, it's honestly a little politically naive. One of the quotes at the core of the film is, people shouldn't be afraid of their governments, governments should be afraid of their people, which is emblematic of a certain type of political commentary. Government overreach is the worst sort of overreach. Don't worry about what the corporations are doing over there. Ignore them. It's fine. But the government is going to black bag you for some reason. It willfully ignores how fascism and capitalism work hand in hand. And then we get the, if your own government was responsible for the deaths of over 100,000 people bit. And it talks about how a viral outbreak made people turn on each other. And I know the two aren't exactly the same. In V for Vendetta, the viral outbreak was a, fo a false flag that was very specifically targeted, and COVID-19 was a global pandemic. But in the UK, COVID-19 actually resulted in a bunch of community solidarity, despite killing over 100,000 people. And it didn't cause us to turn into a Hobbesian state of nature where we all attacked each other. The film is very individualist, is what I'm saying. Every collective of people in the film is an evil institution. All the people we like are individuals, not people who make up part of a wider group. There are no community action groups, no workers' union groups, no uh, mutual aid workers, all that sort of thing. And this problem, where everyone is an individual, everyone good is an individual, punctures any attempt the film has to be genuinely anarchist. So, let's take a step back. I'll roll the step back. Don't improvise, Mac. Let's look at what V spends the film actually doing, but we'll leave Evie to one side for the moment. V blows up the old Bailey, he broadcasts a judgy manifesto to the nation, he assassinates people who traumatised him in the past, some of whom are high up in the government, some of whom very much aren't, he gives V masks to a load of people across the UK, and he sets it up so Parliament will be exploded. The revolution happens because of V. There are some things noticeable in V's actions by their absence. First, the film goes from V makes a big speech to the UK, to a kid gets shot by a cop, to the UK rebels, without spending any time on the intervening steps. And let's come back to that. Second, V's way of making Evie like him is to torture her. He doesn't make her feel free of fear by, for example, introducing her to like-minded friends, getting her involved in community activism, mutual aid networks, or anything like that. 
Now the film presents V torturing Evie is pretty clearly the right thing to do, but the film is almost a great deal more interesting. With some changes to how the film was shot and minor changes to the script, the film could have presented V as a deeply flawed and ultimately monstrous character who, nevertheless, sets the UK on a path to anarchic revolution. The film's a bit too fond of how awesome V is for this to be a sound reading of the text, but it's a fun thought experiment. Alan Moore wrote V in his original comic as an anarchist hero. Alan identifies as an anarchist, as do I. For those that don't know, anarchy is a political ideology which rejects unjust hierarchy. So let's look at a simple hierarchy in a community for an example. Some neighbours got together to found a community kitchen where they feed anyone who turns up. You could argue that in this situation the people who in the kitchen have power over those who attend, meaning they're above those people in the hierarchy. However, the community kitchen doesn't demand payment, they don't try to shut down other community kitchens, they don't demand some sort of proof of poverty before they feed people. If it's a hierarchy, it's a harmless one. This is to be contrasted by the current political situation in the UK, where we're about to have an election. The two largest political parties are the Conservatives, who spent 14 years doing their best to destroy the country, and Labour, who have decided to challenge the Conservatives by becoming the Conservative Party of 14 years ago. So we, as voters, have a choice between two parties, the people who wrecked the country, and the people who may make things a little better, but won't make any of the fundamental changes we desperately need. Either political party will react to anyone trying to remove them from power by having them brutalised by a police. That is an unjust hierarchy. Do what we say, or we'll set the police on you. Now, in my opinion, and it is only my opinion, there are different types of anarchists, there's a lot of pluralism going on, my opinion isn't necessarily the right one. An anarchist hero, in my opinion, is a contradiction in terms. Anarchy is about flattening power structures, it's about community, it's about equality. An anarchist hero wouldn't be a person, it would be a community. There's a way of describing politics which Ian Danskin uses, which is, uh, if we look at things in terms of hierarchy, the further right you go, the more steep they want the hierarchy to be, and the more left you go, the more flat we want the hierarchy to be. And so, an anarchist hero is necessarily singling someone out. It's the great man theory of history as opposed to the Marxist theory of history, where populations cause change, not one person. And, with that out of the way, let's return to V for Vendetta, where the film skips from V tells the UK to rise up against fascism, to the UK rises up against fascism, with only a couple of intervening steps. It doesn't show communities coming together, it doesn't show groups advocating for each other, it doesn't show civil resistance, civil sabotage, civil anti-fascist violence, it doesn't show, in other words, the thousands of heroic things that people do every day when resisting authoritarianism. I've been a little snarky about V blowing up the Old Bailey and the Houses of Parliament, but I should point out that acts of civil sabotage, such as that, aren't invalid as an approach. Sabotaging oil infrastructure, for example, is a valid way to process climate change. Sabotage is a wonderful thing, but it won't get you anywhere by itself. Also, while I'm on tangents, Guy Fawkes, the guy who tried to blow up the House of Lords in 1605, wasn't an anarchist trying to free the UK from a totalitarian government. He was a Catholic who wanted to blow up a Protestant king and a bunch of high-ranking Church of England officials so they could be replaced by Catholics. There's a lot of history to get into about the history of violence between Catholics and Protestants, but let's say it was an attempt to revert to a previous violent authoritarian status quo rather than to free the UK from a violent authoritarian status quo. My spouse was surprised V for Vendetta could get made, given that it was a proudly pro-terrorist film and was released in 2005, a mere four years since the 11th of September attacks. I personally think it's not massively surprising. Firstly, because it very specifically doesn't present a blueprint for revolution. It doesn't show the steps a group of citizens might need to take in order to free themselves from stagnant authoritarian liberal democracy. V blows up buildings, makes a speech and delivers some masks to people, and tortures his only friend. That's it. Secondly, because V for Vendetta presents a world like ours but turned up to 11. LGBTQIA pluses are black bagged simply for being non allo cishet. As bad as things are for my trans siblings right now, we're not black bagged merely for existing at time of recording. Hollywood has a history of presenting revolutions against the worst governments imaginable. This is partly because it means action heroes can blow up baddies without the audience worrying about it being morally justified. However, over time, multiple films and TV shows taking this approach works to create the assumption in the minds of the audience that rebellion and revolution is only justified when things have got that bad. 
films, TV, books and so on, like the For Vendetta, when viewed as a group, argue that we shouldn't rebel against our current governments, despite the fact that our governments aren't taking meaningful action on just so many issues from race to climate change, and this failure to act will cause human civilization to collapse in a scant few decades. And that is why I kind of hate the For Vendetta. It's focused on a heroic, murderous individual, rather than a group taking collective action. It focuses on assassinations and blowing up buildings, creating symbols rather than building community. It presents torture as a good thing because it frees the protag from fear rather than as someone who's been traumatized by someone she trusted. It skips over showing communities taking action by themselves and skips straight to presenting a civil uprising. 